Children, our most precious gift. Yet thousands of children are dying every day, dying because they don't have access to the medical care that we enjoy in America. Thankfully, in our midst, there are people who are changing that one child at a time. Hello, I'm Chad Everett. In the next 30 minutes, you will see the remarkable story of three children from three different countries. Each has come to Charleston, South Carolina to be made whole again. Now, these children were brought to our shores by the Gift of Life program underwritten by 74 Rotary Clubs in coastal South Carolina. Since 1986, 76 youngsters from around the world have been brought here to receive these life-saving operations. Nationally, thousands of children have been saved. But this isn't just a television program about medical miracles. It's a television program about the miracles that can happen when a community comes together to help those most in need, and come together they do. Students at the College of Charleston hold an annual soccer tournament to raise money for gift of life. MUSC and other area hospitals provide world-class medical care for the young patients. Highly skilled physicians donate their services. Volunteer families agree to host visitors for weeks or even months while the kids recover. In the next 30 minutes, it will be impossible to keep a smile from your lips or a tear from your eye, because at a time when all of America is looking for heroes, we had to look no further than Charleston, South Carolina. Because it is here that hundreds of extraordinary people have band together to give dozens of children the very gift of life. This is their story. Ivalio Bochkov had a dream. Nothing extraordinary. The Bulgarian teenager just wanted to play soccer like his friends. But Ivalio's heart would not let him realize his dream. Operated on twice in his home country, Ivalio nearly died after the last operation. His last chance is a trip to America. And as you will see in this story, the tremendous battles waged by these young warriors are as tough on their parents as they are on the kids. A mother's love for her son knows no bounds, and that love is only greater when the son is facing death. Rumiana and Ivalio Bochkov are just such a mother and son. Though 14-year-old Ivalio looks healthy, he is suffering from a heart ailment that could end his life. Ivalio is suffering from a blockage in his ventricular aorta, a blockage that in America is usually diagnosed and corrected in infancy. But in his native Bulgaria, Ivalio has already undergone two operations, and the blockage remains. During the second operation, Ivalio went into a two-week coma and nearly died. During the operation, an air embolism occurred, causing a cerebral edema. My son's condition became very complicated, and he was between life and death. This second operation also made Ivalio's problem worse. Now his parents face an awful choice. Subject Ivalio to another operation in Bulgaria, which might kill him, or do nothing, and let their son face an almost certain death. Desperate, friends of the Bochkovs contacted MUSC via the internet to see if anything can be done to save Ivalio's life. In turn, the hospital contacted the Gift of Life program. The hospital contacted me and said, we would like to fix this child's heart. Can you help? And I immediately said, yes, we would be glad to. Give us the information and we'll get him here. So on November 9th, 2000, Evalio Bochkov and his mother arrive in Charleston, hoping against hope that Evalio's heart blockage can be fixed and that he will survive the operation. They are met at the airport by Sharon and Mark Foster. For the next few weeks, the Fosters will play host to the Bochkovs, taking them on endless rounds of doctor's appointments and tests. For the Fosters, Evalio's case has a special resonance. Their oldest son, Ryan, suffered from a similar ailment at birth. Obviously, that was our first child, and we were very concerned about that. And he got great care, and, and basically it, it uh, healed itself. It closed up. There was no real long-term uh, ill effects, and, and he's fine. 
Days after arriving in Charleston, Ryan takes Evalio to his school, showing him the life of a typical American teenager. That's all I heard about for, uh, for about the next week, was uh, how cute the little Bulgarian kid was. Unfortunately, because of his heart problem, Evalio tires easily and often has problems keeping up. All the kids in the neighborhood play kick the can and different games, and Evo would get right out there with him as long as he could, and then he'd, he'd get tired, he'd come in and he'd rest. Fatigue is just one problem preying on Rumiana's mind. She remains constantly tense and worried. She cannot forget that she nearly lost her son the last time he was operated on. She was scared for her, her son, plus being in a whole different country, didn't know the language and didn't know any people, didn't you know, have any family with her. We had heard that she and, and the family had been told that, you know, basically all that could be done for him was done for him and that if he had to have another surgery, that would be it. He probably wouldn't live through it. But MUSC doctors lift the burden from Rumiana's shoulders with wonderful news. Evalio does not need an invasive operation to correct his blockage. Instead, a much less risky procedure, an angioplasty, which requires no cutting, can fix Evalio's problem. Upon hearing the news, Rumiana finally smiles. Her son is in much less danger. We have to assess where things are after the surgery was done there and find out why the blood pressure is so high. But his case, uh, based on the pictures that they brought from Bulgaria, is a little more complicated because the artery takes a very sharp turn at the area where the obstruction was repaired. You're gonna feel a little sting and a burn, okay? A catheter is inserted from Evalio's groin area to his heart. Dr. Radke hopes that he will be able to expand the narrowed artery without having to subject Evalio to major surgery. Dr. Radke makes full use of the advanced technology that is available to him. He is searching for the exact location of the blockage that has plagued Evalio since birth. So that's where the obstruction is. Part of Dr. Radke's challenge? To repair the work that was done by the Bulgarian doctors in previous efforts to help Evalio. The left main carotid that supplies the brain. And then other branch is missing because the kind of surgery they did that branch they used to turn down and repair the obstruction. So here's a significant obstruction. Now the delicate work of measuring the obstruction and determining the course of treatment begins. The entire surgical team is focused like a laser on the monitors and on their patient. While Evalio is sedated, they insert a device into his heart that will expand the artery increasing blood flow and lowering his blood pressure. The procedure is a success. Here he comes. <laughs> Evalio's father, Krizmir, did not have the money to accompany his son to America. But after selling off some land, he arrives in Charleston just hours after Evalio's procedure. Evalio writes a note to his father telling him he was all right. Note in hand, Mark Foster goes to the airport to greet Chris Meir. He came walking up and uh, I saw him and he saw me holding the sign. And then I flipped the page over and he, he read it and he started tearing up and I started tearing up and, and we embraced and, and you know, I thought, man, this is, this is what it's all about. I saw my son and it was like nothing had happened and I was very happy. With Evalio's health restored, the Fosters welcomed the Bochkovs to a traditional American Thanksgiving dinner. Also on the menu, a prayer of Thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Austin. Okay. To our Bulgarian friends, cheers. Amen. Cheers. Before the Bochkovs start the trek back to Bulgaria, there are hugs all around as the Fosters say goodbye to their Bulgarian friends. But this is only a temporary parting as Evalio hopes to return, not as a hospital patient, but as a student. He wants to have information about going to the Citadel here in Charleston. And uh, I, I don't know if that can work. I don't know how that might happen, but I'm certainly going to look into it for him and see. Evalio Bochkov, age 14, and his mother, Rumiana, have both received 
the gift of life. The Fosters report that young Evalio was doing fine and making good use of his new soccer gear. Our next story focuses on young Samantha Constant. Less than two years old, Samantha was suffering from a life-threatening heart condition. Now, what you will see is how a remarkable partnership between Gift of Life, First Scots Presbyterian Church, MUSC, and the Charleston community helped put the sparkle back in the eyes of young Samantha. The beaches of the island nation of Haiti are renowned the world over for their beauty. Tourists flock to these shores, looking to shuck everyday cares and to feel alive again. But almost no one ventures to the island of Laganov, which lies off the coast of Haiti. It too is alive, alive with the flotsam and jetsam of human existence. It was here where Samantha Constant was born. It was here where a visiting group from Charleston's First Scots Presbyterian Church found the very sick baby girl. I think at the time that I saw her initially, she was about 15 to 18 months old. And at that time, she uh, was still unable to crawl, unable to walk, unable to really stand with, any, with much strength. Instead of having two ventricles or two pumping chambers of the heart, she had uh, just one. Um, and as a consequence, the amount of blood going to her lungs uh, was low and got lower and lower as time went by. So by the time she came to us, she was very uh, cyanotic or blue. Left untreated, her condition would soon kill her. Dr. Pam Morris could not accept that verdict. As a physician and as a mother, what I knew was the only difference between Samantha and a child of my own was that Samantha had the misfortune to be born in Haiti. And that seemed very unfair to me. I knew that a child in the United States would have already had that heart surgery, but I knew that there had to be a way uh, to get that child here. And so when I left, I just said to the parents that this is what we're able to do, and I promise you that I promise you that we will find a way to bring Samantha to the United States to have the heart surgery that she needs. Constantly in the back of Dr. Morris's mind was that Samantha needed the operation right away and that without it, she would die. It took longer than I had uh, expected. Altogether, it took five months for me to uh, find all the resources that we needed and to uh, work the way through the bureaucracy of, of obtaining visas. We had to write letters to the embassy and we did that through uh, one of the local senators and um, get that approved and that takes several weeks. Just when almost all the hurdles had been cleared, one more obstacle was placed in Samantha's path. The day that Samantha was to leave, there was actually an attempted coup in uh, Haiti. And the problem was that her ticket was to have been delivered Federal Express to her. An angel in the Episcopal Diocese took a taxi across town to the closed Federal Express offices in spite of the violence in the streets got the ticket and got the ticket into Samantha's, Samantha's father's hands uh, that day so that she'd be able to make the flight out. Five months after being diagnosed with a fatal heart defect, Samantha Constant and her father, Jason, finally arrive in Charleston. Samantha's mother, eight months pregnant with their second child, stays home in Haiti. My wife was pregnant at the time. She cried day and night because she wanted to see Samantha. From the beginning, it was clear that Samantha and her father shared a deep love. Her father adored her. He, you could look at him and just see the glow in his face every time he looked upon this child. Samantha also has a special bond with the parishioners at First Scots. Two days after arriving, Sam and Jason are warmly welcomed by their benefactors at the church. Samantha is the center of attention with youth groups, during church services, even while taking her bottle. She is also the center of attention in the home of Bubba and Elaine Simmons, her host family. The Simmons had hosted two other Gift of Life recipients, but Samantha's visit had special meaning to them. Their son was diagnosed with a similar condition 
at birth. How fortunate we are to have everything right at our fingertips. And I didn't even have to think about it, research it, everything was taken care of. Um, they don't have any options where they are. And in most cases, they say, just don't bother, you know, go have another child. It's pre-dawn, but the Medical University of South Carolina is already bustling, preparing to give Samantha Constant a new life. When he sees her again in the ICU, she'll have a breathing tube down. There'll be lots of monitors, lots of sounds. She may not be able to speak to him, but I think that holding her hand, she'll know that he's there. Before preparing Samantha for the operation, First Scott's pastor, Dr. Don Day, leads Jason and his American family in prayer. We'll work through the doctors and surgeons and nurses. Then, Samantha receives an injection that will help her sleep. When she wakes up several hours later, she will, the good Lord willing, be a healthy 20-month-old. After carrying the sleeping Samantha to the operating room, Jason must give her up to the team who will give her a new lease on life. There we go. You in unfamiliar surroundings, his daughter's fate in the hands of strangers, Jason is inconsolable. He was able to keep control of what was happening to her up at that point, and he had to just give it up at that point. But your son is very religious, and when they asked, you know, if, if there was anything he needed, if there was anything he needed, he said, God will take care of it. And so he was comforted by that. So basically, we just sat with him and, and waited. This is the uh, IV in the central vein. Um, so you can tell him everything went very well. We hooked up the vein from the upper body to the lungs and divided the, the old connection from the heart out to the lungs. We got, divided that. Yes. You're welcome. Meanwhile, Bubba Simmons, owner of Simmons Seafood Store, relays the good news back to Samantha's mother in Haiti. We were relaying the call through my company to his wife, in Haiti, and uh, it, it was it's just very touching because he wanted so bad to to tell his wife that you know Samantha was out of surgery and and things look good. But it is this image that greets Jason the first time he sees Samantha post-op. Overcome, he leaves. But just three days later, it's a completely different story. A much happier Jason now plays with his recovering daughter. I saw that she was alive. She was happy and doing everything. It was a miracle for me she was doing so well, and I was happy. Samantha is also happier. Even the staff at MUSC can't resist her charm. Let me see your belly, Samantha. In fact, after her miracle operation, Samantha is progressing well ahead of schedule. I mean, these surgeries are, are huge and taxing, and um, I think these kids are just fighters to get through this. Samantha begins the next stage of that fight at the Simmons home in Mount Pleasant. Elaine Simmons noticed a big improvement. She didn't cry. She whimpered. It was very soft. You couldn't hear it if she actually did cry. Um, she didn't move around a lot sat or was held. Afterwards, she, Jerson spent most of his time bent over holding her fingers while she walked around the house. And she was much more animated and happier just because she had the energy to do it. And just days after her operation, Sam is making herself very comfortable with her host family, bonding easily with host mother, Elaine Simmons. Oh, look at you. Say bonsoir, bonsoir. Three-year-old Caitlin even goes so far as to share her favorite stuffed animal with Samantha. And she, and she got it. You're sharing pink baby. I see that. Samantha Constant, 20 months old, is blossoming every day, thanks to the love and kindness of dozens of people she has never met. She has received the gift of life 
in so many ways. You can't pack enough stuff in those suitcases to send back with them. And the, and the airline limits which you, how many left pieces you can send. So, and we load them up with as much as we can because they just don't have access to what we have here. Before Samantha and her father leave, it's back to where her long journey began, First Scott's Presbyterian Church in Charleston. Jason moves the congregation when he stands to sing a song he wrote, a song of thanksgiving, a song of love. Samantha and her father had uh, tears in every member's eyes, had the members singing songs, holding hands and swaying in the aisles. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I would, I would say that uh, Samantha blessed us more than we could ever have hoped to bless her, truly. Tragically, the triumphant story of Samantha Constant has an unhappy ending. Although her heart operation was a complete success, Samantha died this past December, just shy of her third birthday. Samantha died from pneumonia, a victim of the poverty and filth of her native Haiti. Poverty and filth that no technology is a match for. Hira Curdy is on the road to a healthy and happy adulthood. Born in the war zone of Kosovo, five-year-old Hira was also suffering from a debilitating heart condition. Enter Gift of Life. Kosovo, the images are hauntingly familiar from the nightly news. Scenes of war, of devastation, of crimes against humanity that are unspeakable. Yet even the rubble of a place like Kosovo cannot stifle the human spirit. A spirit that burns bright in five-year-old Hira Kurti and her mother Tahira a spirit that keeps the seriously ill Hira alive. Her chance of developing normally, growing normally, uh, living uh, to be a teenager, much less uh, an adult, was pretty slim, uh, if not essentially zero. Fatigue rules Hira's life. She spends much of her day in her mother's lap, unable to summon the energy needed to play and crying often. Hira and Tahira arrive in Charleston for an operation that will save the youngster's life. For Tahira, the trip is bittersweet. While the operation will save her daughter's life, she must leave her two other children back in Kosovo. Her youngest is just six weeks old. At the airport, Amy and Westy Westmoreland and their two children wait anxiously. Also waiting anxiously, members of the local media attracted by the human interest angle of this story. They were very tired. They had traveled over 24 hours with several stops in between their homeland and here. And they step off into this new place with all these lights, all this attention focused on them. They were tired. They were facing a major, you know, surgery. And so it was just, they were just terrified. You could just sense that. And so my first instinct was to just get them home so that they could rest. Within minutes of meeting, Anna Westmoreland and Hira Curti are already fast friends, walking hand in hand out of the airport. That friendship continues at home as Anna shows Hira to her room. Both mothers also immediately bond, struggling with a dictionary to communicate. Tahira, just, she has it all together. You could just tell that. She obviously had a very good presence about her and a sense about herself. and. I feel like I bonded a lot with her and um, she just, she carried herself so well and I feel like she was strong for her daughter. The bonding continues with the Westmorelands taking as much delight in each new experience as Hira does. From fast food restaurants to Hira's first ice cream sandwich to a visit to the Charleston Museum. That togetherness even extends to the endless rounds of testing that Hira has to go through. Testing done, Hira is ready for her operation. Her mother, though, is understandably nervous. She left a six-week-old baby at home along with another four-year-old son. So it was, 
incredibly stressful, I think, for Tahira to be over here knowing that she had two other children at home who needed her. Uh, so all of the stress, I think it just came into full effect that day. So it was just a matter of keeping her going. Dr. Fred Crawford understands Tahira's anxiety. He has operated on thousands of children during his three decades in medicine. To a certain extent, Hira had been selected out by nature. Uh, in other words, if her disease had been terribly severe, she would not have survived to be uh, four years of age. We had to go in and uh, close the hole uh, in her heart, uh, which we do by putting the patients on a heart-lung machine, uh, stopping the heart, uh, going inside, finding the defect, uh, and using a patch to close the hole. So that's kind of part one. And then part two is to rebuild the blood vessel going to her lungs. And we were fortunate enough, and her anatomy was fortunate enough, that we could go in and relieve her obstruction, at the same time preserve her pulmonary valve. I marvel every day at, at the ability to stop a heart uh, in a child that weighs four or five pounds to go inside of it, find the defect, close it, uh, and, uh, and then to have the heart start back up again and function as it should. And you really can't do this without the entire team. Uh, you can be a fantastic surgeon, but if the rest of the people are not there to do their job, uh, you'll fall flat on your face and the patient won't do well. Now, post-op, Hira's biggest challenge is to get better. The Westmorelands have an additional challenge, helping Hira and her mother enjoy America after years in war-torn Kosovo. And one thing that made a big impact on me is they were laughing about walking on the grass, and they said they never walk on the grass in Kosovo because that's where all the landmines are. Bye. She just loved being in the pool, and it was the same way with the ocean. She, I, I remember Hura and her mother Tahira walking down to the beach for the first time and with their bare feet in the sand going into the waves. and. It, it was interesting to see their reaction, but it was just so breathtaking to see how they took in everything. A lot of times she wanted me to hold her, and, um, and that felt good to me to, to hold her. She, was, she could be a tough little girl when she wanted to be, too, so, which was fun, too. I mean, to be honest with you, it was, it was fun. fun. She had <laughs> both her and her mother were very spunky, so. Indeed, almost every person who comes in touch with Hira and her mother are changed by the experience. To see the look in the parent's eye when they walk into the ICU to see that their child's okay and is gonna live and it's gonna be all right, it, it's just fantastic. You have to experience it and, and, and that motivates you to, to come back on over and over and over and do it again. I don't operate on children from other countries so that they'll think better of Americans. I don't operate on them so they'll think better of me. Um, I operate on them because this is a child that has an illness that I can help. Frequently people have asked us, why would you do something like this, why? And it's something where I think my only answer is why not? How could you not help someone sure. who needs that? You know, I mean, what is six weeks of my life when you look at your whole life compared to what you could accomplish to help someone else like that? It's just, there's no way you could turn it down. While each of these children has had their hearts repaired, the hundreds of heroes who helped save them have received even more. They've had their hearts touched as well. In a world that is often senselessly cruel and inhuman, they have reached across oceans to help children they don't even know, not because they have to, but because they want to. These people, most of whom will never see their name in headlines, have taught us what's really important. They've taught us that within all our hearts, each of us has the capacity to give the gift of life. I'm Chad Everett. Thank you for watching.